thanks for having me. Thanks for the Heart Foundation for bringing me over. Uh, I'm not too sure how many traffic engineers are on the Heart Foundation role. Probably not that many, eh? <coughs> That's my job. I'm a traffic engineer. A boring old... Yeah? Sometimes in rooms like this, the Antichrist gets mentioned. <laughs> if I didn't make such a mess, you guys' job wouldn't be so hard, yeah? <coughs> it's a... Um, Oh, beauty. I've got a pointer and everything. I, I do a lot of work in making new streets, old streets, and uh, one of the things I always find interesting to ask people, and seeing as I've got an audience that I can actually see and speak to, who's got a favourite street? Where is it? This, this city? Yeah. Yep. Um, Chester Street. Chester Street. Who knows where that is? Is it a good one? Yeah, what do we like about that? Grapes. Yeah, sorry? Grapes. Grapes? Ah, uh, <laughs> yeah, nice. Um, actually, I'm going to say my son's favourite street, which is the uh, Esplanade in Cairns. He loves it because it's 30k an hour and the next thing he can get across there. They sort of can get across there too, which is kind of lucky because half of them are full as butcher's dogs when they try and cross that street there. <laughs> so it's kind of lucky they can get across that one. The interesting thing about that one is it's a relatively new street and it's going to be number three on my list of new streets. Out of all the thousands of people I've asked that question, that's only the third one that someone's mentioned a street that was built after the war. The ones we build now, nobody likes them. The only ones they like were the ones we built ages ago. No one except for that one. That would be a borderline one. And in its state, it's a new street. And someone's recently fixed the whole thing up. The other one was the Cavill Mall. Who knows where that is? Who's been there? Cavill Mall on the Gold Coast. And the other one was a street in this guy's development. He said it was his favourite street. So I reckon that's a bit of a biased response. <clears throat> We've kind of forgotten what they're about. We make them like they're little roads now and it's just the wrong way to go about it. Brent Tedarian, someone, a lot of you would have heard him speak, if you build your car for traffic, you'll get a city for traffic. Yeah? If we design little roads, the behaviour will be like a road. So the cars are most important. Make sure that machine is nice and settled and it's got a nice little park to sleep overnight and it's nice and warm. And if there's any place left for the humans on the edge, then we'll see what we can do. We should be the most important. Streets are about us. The way streets return their value to the community is by the land use that's on the edge prospering. It's been able to give someone a job. Yeah? It's been able to turn money over through the community. People can buy, spend. That's what streets are for. How you move along them longitudinally is completely irrelevant to its value to the community. It actually doesn't start making, any traffic engineers, it doesn't start making money till the level of service gets down to E and F, till it's completely congested for cars. And yet all our planning schemes have got this policy that said it has to work at level of C or better. And so the land use in our streets will slowly deteriorate. What took its place? Where do we shop and gather now? Malls. Malls. <laughs> Yeah. But it's because our streets, they're not compatible with human life anymore. So we made an artificial one instead. And so that, who knows that place up there on the screen now? It's Melbourne. Yeah, Melbourne's a pretty big town. We do better than Melbourne. You should go and visit this one, Giles. This is a great spot. Hardware Lane. Hardware Lane. Yeah. You get a chocolate. <laughs> you can see from the sign up there on the edge that... Oh, that did wasn't supposed to work. <clears throat> I'm not a great photographer. I missed this thing here, but you can go at 10 kilometres an hour down here if you want. But you just don't because of why. There's too many people in the way. Yeah, Giles has got some pictures there building some of these in Auckland at the moment. It's a, sh it's a genuinely shared street. It's not just a normal little road with just all, all pavers across it. It's a genuinely shared space. If you do want to drive there, you've got to start negotiating for space. Look at the guy and say, are you going to move out of my way or I'll wait here till you cross or whatever. 
Yeah. And when they do drive down there, it's actually only at Sparrowsfart in the morning when they do all the deliveries and then it's just the humans take it over. It's a good space. This is we're one of the three most favourite, when I say what's your favourite street, this will be one of the top three, Hardware Lane. The other one is Chapel Street in Stonington. Who's been to Chapel Street? Emptied your wallet in there, yeah? Good street. Crown Street in Surrey Hills in Sydney. It's another good one. That always gets up there in the list. These streets are for humans, yeah? Some of them have cars in them, some of them don't but it's a genuine economic driver. The land use on those streets prospers. You can't drive down it. All of those three streets are just a traffic, to use a technical traffic term, and you can write this down, it's a shit fight. <laughs> <clears throat> Ironically, Chapel Street, I wouldn't be allowed to, oh, Crown Street either. I wouldn't be allowed to build them now. That Osroads book that all your engineers sort of bow to every morning and all that sort of stuff, light a little candle. It doesn't let you do that anymore. The lanes are too narrow, the bike lane's too narrow, the parking lane's too narrow, the footpath is too narrow. Nothing works except it's Australia's most prosperous street. So except for the fact that it's brilliant, everything else about it's wrong, according to the road designers. It's because someone built that as a street not as a road, and so for us, as humans, it works. If you're in a car, or actually even if you're in the tram, it doesn't work, it's too congested, it's too much of a mess. But it's the second highest uh, retail rent in Melbourne. It's a good functional street. It returns economic activity to that community brilliantly. It's a good street. What about this one? What about this? Who likes this one? This incidentally has never come up on the favourite street list, this particular one. This is not a stupid question, is this a perfect street? The reason I keep this photo is because um, when I was writing the book, a guy from this particular town sent me in a few photos of his little estate. He said, Steve, you have to include this in the book because this is the perfect street. Now, he wasn't just some bozo off the street. He developed this estate and he'd done a lot of others in the community. He was a very, very successful businessman. His son's taken over the business. It's very, very successful. So it's not an uneducated statement why he thinks it's a perfect street and why would he say that? Got a footpath. It is a bit neat and tidy. That's not why he said it, though. He's a developer, remember? Why would he say it? It did make him money. That's part of it. <clears throat> oh, there's another traffic engineer down the back. I just recognised him. <clears throat> It went through council like that. That's why he liked it. It ticked as the first one he'd done, he said, that ticked every single box in that local government and he had an approval within six or seven months. So to, so to that local government, it is a perfect street. It ticked every box. What's the health profile of the people who live in this street, Rachel? They've got nowhere to walk. They are in the middle of nowhere. The nearest school is four kilometres away. The nearest shop is about the same. Average speed on this street is about 65 kilometres an hour. Yeah. These kids are never going to get to know each other. This is a perfect street for the guy who makes the games. Because yeah. the most exciting thing to do in that street is to stay inside and play Nintendo. Yeah. They'll never play football on that street. They'll never play cricket on that street. It is a horrible place, and yet that particular local government, that's what it wants. There's none of them in South Australia, is there? <laughs> <laughs> the great bit about these footpaths is that they'll last forever, won't they? There's no one's going to walk on them. They will last forever. Yeah. <clears throat> so this is a bit of a problem, isn't it? Why do we build these then? If, if we think they're so bad, why do we build them? Why are they everywhere? Why are they still being built today as I sit here? There's someone building one now. How does it get away with that? Bloody baby boomers. <laughs> what did it? 
This street does one thing quite well. It gets that car out of the garage and to, to the arterial road system very, very quickly. And after the war, we thought that was probably the best way to move people around. We got access to a car finally. This concentration that I need to get a quality mixed-use urban space together, it's quite hard. Ah, oh, thank goodness I don't have to do it anymore. I can put everything way out there. So everything that smells and makes a noise, I can put it right over there. And I can put all the jobs in this corner and all the houses over there and all the schools over here. And because everyone's got a car, I can connect them up like that. But if you connect it up by a car, that's what your neighbourhood looks like. So why, how are we going to stop that? Any land use planners in the room? Hands up. <coughs> Very brave. Well done. <coughs> yes, we do. Knowing full well that someone's life here is going to be shorter, because of the environment we put them in there, we still send them out there. That's mean, and we've got to stop doing it. I was lucky enough to spend some time uh, in Toronto, fastest growing, economically the fastest growing city in North America. I said to Jennifer, how do you do it? And I said, we don't build house and land anymore. One answer. Don't build house and land anymore. Fastest growing population city in North America, 100% infill development. And they're slowly catching up by the end of this decade. They'll be the highest walking and the highest PT as well. We can fix this. The market is ready to fix it. we just got to, instead of every time we update our plan, just change the date and change the title and move ahead, we've got to apply some brain power about how we put our cities together so that this is the hardest thing to do and the stuff that we like. Places where you can walk to school, walk to footy practice, walk to ballet, walk to work, they should be the easiest places to build. And at the moment, they're the hardest. <clears throat> Pretty much every local government I go to says, Steve, you don't have to spend any time on this slide. We already do this. Pedestrians at the top of our tree. We think they're the most important. And I'm pretty sure at the policy part of the front of the corporate documents, it actually does say that. But where the rubber hits the road, you might be a bit further off than you think. If I walked into a local government in South Australia, I said, right, me and my mate have bought a few sort of little light industrial sheds right on the fringe of the urban bit. We're going to build 12 beautiful townhomes, three-storey, three-bedroom, enough for a family to live in. We can walk in distance to a school, walking distance to a shop. I've got a market. I'm going to sell them like hotcakes. I know that I can sell them without car parking. So I'm not going to do a traffic impact assessment, but I'll donate money to your walking program and to your cycling program, and I'll do up the bus stop down at the corner. What would happen to me when I walked into pre-lodgement saying that? They would just laugh at me, wouldn't they? And say, you idiot. You've got to do a traffic impact assessment first, and you've got to show me how you address your minimum parking rate. These guys are still the most important. Got to make sure the car's got a lovely place to sleep. Don't care where you sleep. As long as your car's got a nice place to be kept overnight and the poor thing doesn't get held up on its way to work, then you can do whatever you like with the humans as long as the car's looked after. That's mean too, isn't it? What do we do that for? Of course, there is a reason why we do that, because what's the most, who works in local government, what's the biggest thing people complain about more than anything else? Oh. Traffic and parking. Yeah? So it's a bit trite to say, let's just swap this upside down. I reckon we're more than a generation of living like this. Someone's got to educate all those baby boomers that their car is not the most important thing in the world. That humans matter. And if you don't make a place for humans, they'll move. You can, the car-dominated cities have got a big dip in their demographic profile between 18 and 25. They don't want to own a car. They don't want to spend any money on it. They want to spend it on cider bars and street food and skinny jeans and fixed-wheeled bicycles. <laughs> and if you have a town where they have to buy a car to participate, they'll just go to another town. 
And if you look at the demographic profile of inner urban Sydney and inner urban Melbourne, they've got a big spike between 25 and up still between 18 and 25. People say the inner city is the most expensive place to live, but they find a way. They don't have to spend 10, 15 thousand dollars a year maintaining a car. They share a house with their mate. They eat out every night. They're not the biggest earners, but they're the biggest spenders, and we're scaring them all away. The success of your city depends on how easy it is to survive in it without a car. If you've got a car-based city, you're not a top-tier city. Who knows what this picture on the left is? Except for the GTA guy, he knows what it is, he probably do. It's a traffic model outfit there. So the red bits, whatever you do, next budget, you've got to throw all your money at making sure there's no red bits because they're congested bits. Because the model said so. So you can't have congestion, so you have to spend money here and here and here and here to get rid of these red bits. We can't have congestion because congestion's bad and people complain about it and we can't have that. This is a little intersection outside uh, our office in Maroochydore on the Sunshine Coast. Who's been there for a holiday? Yeah, not a bad spot. To put it in context, this little bit over here is a caravan park. This here used to be the corner shops that serviced that caravan park. Laundry, ice cream shop, pizza. Yeah, you know the drill. You've been on caravan holidays as a kid. This over here, it's a multi-storey hotel, the Siebel Tower or something might be a one other chain hotel by now, but it's one of those. Downstairs, it's got a McDonald's, eh? And a little bit of retail cafe stuff at the bottom. This used to be just a simple three-way, crossing all legs, but it used to get congested. And the main roads guys didn't like the congestion, so they gave it to a traffic engineer to fix. Can you fix this congestion? Bloody hell, I can. Give it here. So we put in these slip lanes so that these people didn't have to queue up, they could turn left. Same for these guys. So this guy didn't have to wait too long. They took out this ped leg so he doesn't have to wait for the green man. Yeah. So the queues got shorter and it works perfectly. Well done, mate. Here's your money. Congestion gone. Problem solved. Yeah. It's a bigger problem than you think. Now these shops here don't have pizza shop or ice cream shop or laundry. It's got four lease, four lease and four lease in there at the moment. Because these little kids who used to run across to this ice cream shop aren't allowed across the road anymore. Mum won't let them. This is too intimidating a space for a human to deal with and so they don't. This McDonald's got massive pulling power of course so the kids can't resist going there but they still can't cross the road so how do they get from the caravan park to the McDonald's now? Yes indeed, they drive. They have to drive quite a way. They have to come down there, they take this bend at about 100,000 kilometres an hour, they go down to about here and they drive along to a bit and there's a big car park out the back of this McDonald's and they park in here. Just to save these guys five or ten seconds, they've completely destroyed that part of town. I often get asked, why do you traffic engineers keep ruining my city? And the, que the answer to that question is because you asked me to. You told me to fix the congestion at that thing, and I did. You didn't do anything wrong, did you? <laughs> Someone asked the wrong question, didn't they? Yeah? Someone asked the wrong question. These were important parts of this town. These guys had had these shops for a long time. They employed kids after school. Yeah, it was a family business that's gone to save someone a few seconds at an intersection. It happens all over the place. We've got to put car movement in context with quality human life. And I think this is how you do it. This is the most important thing in the Complete Streets book, is severing street hierarchy from road hierarchy. If you have got this anywhere in your policy document, then the Heart Foundation will always have plenty to do. Yeah. The reason it's so car-centric, our movement system, is that the road hierarchy, and that sort of makes sense for that to be car-centric, because it gets people from Adelaide to Melbourne. Yeah. That's what roads do. 
They return their value to the community by moving goods and people long distances without too much interruption. So there's a place for roads in the economy. But streets are for us. We, they, we have to be spending money in them and living in them and playing cricket in them and doing so they're for us. But if you treat streets like roads, you'll always get that Maruchidor problem. And the way to do it is that you have to design a main street so it can sustain the land use on the edge which for a main street is retail and commercial activity. For a mixed use street, you've got to be able to provide residential amenity, a place where you can be. It's part of your living space, a mixed use street, as well as residential and commercial. Streets for living, they've got to be streets you live in, not just on, in. Yeah, it's part of your life. These ones are tricky. There's not, a, there's not as many as you think, but some of them do have to provide a movement and an amenity they're a bit tricky, those. You have to really apply your brain to them. But there's not as many of them as you think. These are important. The front doormat to your community. A visitor to Adelaide will go down to Hindley Street or Rundle Street and they'll develop an opinion on the whole of the city based on their first few minutes in those two streets. Am I coming back? Will I stay a bit longer? Will I have another beer? Will I bring the kids back? Will I open a regional office here? all subconsciously already decided in a few minutes by what people think of the centre. So it's worth spending money on. Those people in the burbs who live in the perfect street who say, what do you always spend money in the middle for? It's because if I don't, your kids won't get a job. It's important. These are very difficult to build. Um, this is another Sunshine Coast street. I must have been on a photo taken spree. Anyone recognise that one? There's only one good street at Noosa. Hastings Street, yeah. It's mixed use. People, lots of people live in those places there, but it's a reasonably successful commercial retail strip. It's, and it's not over noisy, not over excited. They've sort of maintained a little bit of amenity. I get a bit irritated when you see these master plan communities and every second or third street, oh, this is going to be mixed use, this is going to be mixed use. I reckon there's less than 100 good mixed use streets in the world and every master plan community is going to add 20 to it, really? They're extremely difficult to get right. We tried to do one, who's been to Malulba? Fishing, drinking, eating, yeah? We had a crack at that in the early 90s, it was just one retail and fish and chips and crappy old storage stuff above. Up it all went, multi-storey, active retail, my ego got bigger and bigger and bigger, everyone was selling and it was all good. And the people who bought the units up above all turned around and left, sold up or moved out and rented. And I thought, well, what are the, was I made you a beautiful street. Why are you leaving? And we got a bit excited with providing for the retail bit at the bottom and forgot about the people who were living up, that that was their living street. Didn't give them a place where they could just sit and be. They felt like they had to pay six bucks for a cup of tea to sit in their own front yard, which was a bit mean. I didn't mean to do that, but I did it. They're very difficult to get right. You have to have residential amenity and vibrancy in life and an 18 hour economy so that those guys can make money. It's very, very tricky to do. Yes, indeed. You couldn't say your estimate's only 20 successful ones in the world. Um, just looking at that business of what it should provide, that's what you get in Barcelona and there's most of the streets. I'll go back to my previous one. These have residential in them but they're main streets. So their main purpose is to provide street activity and economy and jobs and stuff. This one has to do it all on a... a, a yeah, you're probably right and I've probably exaggerated. I'm probably thinking more about North America and Australia yeah. rather than Europe. I think you, that's probably fair. Yeah, I think that's right. That's a fair comment. Yeah. Yes, I think you're right there. That they do do a much better job of that. And I, I still stick to my my thesis though that we label them so like they're easy to do, and we're typically terrible at them. They either end up being residential towers with vacant ground floors, or they end up being overcooked residential place that all the people upstairs do is complain about the noise. We don't seem to be able to get it right here. Yeah. 
Getting towards it, yeah, add another one street to the list. But I mean, the, the fact that, you know, we think about them so hard is evidence that they're just so difficult to actually get all those pieces in play. And the fact that people just flippantly say, oh, we'll put one here and we'll put one here, not without years and years of intellectual effort, you won't. And that's yeah. Yeah. Yes. Hard work. Very, very hard work. All to create, recreate a situation. If the if the if the market had had its head, it would have worked out perfectly. But anyway, <laughs> who hasn't had a problem with this over the years? Yeah. I had some time with some government people yesterday, and they're all down in the dumps. Oh, we're mucking this up. I said, look. Compared to all the other cities, you aren't mucking it up as much as you think, except in Adelaide's case, this is the one thing you are mucking up a little bit. Yeah? There's a massive oversupply here, a massive oversupply. I'm not so sure if this is your ambition to look like that. Does anyone know where that is? Yeah, isn't it delicious? Yeah, it's real. It actually doesn't look quite that bad now, but it's a real photo. So this is the demography model where you just supply parking space and road space so that everyone can get a house and land in suburbia and everyone's got a parking space in the middle when they get there. Cheap housing, all the things that he think the advantages you get out of that, including this. People think, well, those people in the city of Houston just shouldn't have supplied so much parking. But when they made their city that every journey has to start with a car, then somewhere on the edge of the line, you've got to put it somewhere. All that low density development at 20 dwellings per hectare with all the cul-de-sac streets and all the stuff, I can't get a bus out to those people. Maybe once an hour if they're lucky. So they... If, they, if their car breaks down, they'll starve to death out there. Yeah? <laughs> so if we've forced them into starting their journey with a car, it's got to finish with a car somewhere or other. Someone's got to find a place to put it. You can be very noble and start taking up the supply with commercial development, but if no one can start their journey in a bus or a tram or a train or by walking or cycling because of where we put their residential development, then you've got a problem. We're trying to focus a little bit on the end of the trip too much here and forget that we started this mess by how we forced people to start their journey in a car. It's a, I cannot stress enough how much we have to address that bit about where we put, where we let people live or worse, where we make people live. If we put it a long way away where someone can't walk or ride a bike or catch a bus or a tour, then it's more work for the Heart Foundation. Their life will be shorter than the people who get to live in a walkable neighbourhood. And yet, not full, knowing that full well, we still put them out there. That might be our next asbestos, you know. Active urban places, the more you provide for a car, the less a human is going to enjoy it. The economy of your city hinges on the amount of people that use it without a car. If you provide road space, you are not going to perform as well as if you provide urban public transport, urban biking, urban walking opportunities. People who drive don't spend as much. They stay in town for a lesser amount of time. The retail centres that have more parking, the retail main streets that have more parking, do less trade. How many retailers own up to that? Yeah. They'll say, if you take my parking space, I'll die. And it, you can understand why they think that, because they're just hunting as a lone wolf in their mind. But how they actually work is they hunt in packs. They just don't know it. They haven't learned to hunt with a pack. The worst thing that can happen in a village is that if I've got four things to do in town, I'll park at the accounts and I'll pick up my stuff. Then I'll go and park at the dry cleaners and drop stuff off there. I'll drive to the chemist and pick something up there. All those shops in between those destinations should have a crack at my wallet. But if I'm driving past sitting on it, they've got no chance. 
all that effort they put into that beautiful shop front to the fantastic sign writing, to me as a car driver or passenger, it is meaningless. It only means something if I'm walking past. If I drive past Ben in the street, I'm hardly like to say, let's stop and have a cup of tea. This is not going to happen. It only happens if we're walking past. In active main streets, 40%-ish of the money, you didn't mean to spend it. But if you're driving past, that's all gone. You can't get it. If people are driving, they're not spending. The needs of the car and the needs of the person in this main street environment are exactly the opposite. Who comes back from Barcelona and takes photos of all the level of service B and C streets? All these beautiful streets, this, you hardly ever get held up in your car here. You take photos of these places, which are actually a traffic nightmare, but they're exciting and you love them. As a human, they're a good space. And we've actually stopped making them about 50 years ago. We have to do it a different way. We have to start with the land use that we want to prosper. Streets and street networks take on a certain shape that allow shops and commercial places to make money, that allow people to live healthy lives. Then we go down to, OK, well, how's that going to function? People are going to have to walk here. They're going to have to ride. If we can't get them on the bus, we don't want them to use a car. Then it starts to take a function and then a form. Once you have your form, then you can use your traffic model to say, look, I need them to be all this width, otherwise none of these land uses are going to prosper. Where do all the cars go if I do that? Oh, well, they stack up for miles and they queue. Well, that's just it. That has to be like that then. Because if you keep widening it so that you get no traffic congestion, all your land use will just wither and die. Four lease signs, high unemployment. If you're uncertain about how your form is going to go, because it's not like anything you've done before, notwithstanding it was like we used to do it before all the time, try it out. So look, OK, I'm not going to argue with it. Let's just try it for three months and see if it works. See if, as you suggest, the whole world will implode if I do have a more than 10 second traffic delay. Probably won't, yeah. There's no such thing as intolerable congestion, is there? Otherwise, the last guy, he wouldn't be in the queue. If it's intolerable to him, he won't come back tomorrow. People sit in traffic congestion because they want to. They made a conscious choice somewhere along the line about where to live or where to work or how the kids should get to school that put them in that queue. But they're equally free to make a different one if you give them an alternative. I'll finish off. I think you should develop some of these for yourself, like little touchstones that remind you what you're doing. Every day at work, there's bushfires to put out, there's ministers ringing up, irritating you, councillors, mayor, etc., etc. Just shit you. You, know? you have to have a clear course that you can just go back to and say, be calm, this is what I'm here for. I'm here to make good places. I'm here to extend people's lives. I'm here to give people jobs. I'm here to make a great city. Just touchstones that remind you of what you're doing. Mine are probably a little bit too simplistic. Make up your own. The one I, I probably use the most is that the exemplar street. Like, I think of my favourite streets. I say, what made that one good? Am I helping this place get one of those? You know, will people come back and take photos of this and send it to their mates in Barcelona and say, look where I've just been? Yeah? No one took a photo of the perfect street and sent it to their mate in Barcelona, did they? Yeah? <laughs> we, we've got to make better places. How much money are we spending retrofitting places that we mucked up? Yeah? Are we just going to keep doing that? Joel's going to do a presentation about rescue in the city of Auckland. He shouldn't have had to spend all that money. I mean, he's had a great time doing it. It's all fun and games. But they should have been like that. And to be fair, you might know the history, they probably were like that, and then we made them for cars, and he's got to try and transfer and give them back to the people again. It's hard work. We shouldn't have to do that. Yeah? We've got to stop making perfect streets. Yeah? 
It seems like a long way off and we tend to overestimate what we can achieve in a short time, but we underestimate what we can achieve in 20 years and it's not that long. I'll still be working in 20 years. We can do magnificent things in that time. We can make wonderful places. We can make a comeback, yeah? Thanks for listening to me. Thank you.